Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, celebrating 50 years of sharing God's unconditional love and grace. Welcome to the Gospel Truth broadcast. Welcome to a very special edition of the Gospel Truth. You are three parts, spirit, soul, and body. Healing is a part of the atonement of Christ. God wants you well. How can you doubt that you'll get it if you've already got it? You're already blessed. Everything that Jesus came to do, the power for it is released through the gospel, the good news, the nearly too good to be true news. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. I'm nearing the end of my 12th week of teaching verse by verse through the book of Proverbs. We've broken this up into segments, but it has been a long series, and I believe that the benefit of this is just tremendous. We're sharing truths here that the average person just doesn't ever deal with this. It's like these thoughts have never come to them. Did you know we don't just automatically, intuitively walk in wisdom? You have to seek for wisdom. You have to search for it. These Proverbs said that you have to hunt for it like you do gold and silver. You know, I live in Colorado and I am amazed. And when I go up to these old gold mines and drive up on these mountains and think about the hardship and all of the things that people went through just to get this gold and silver, man, great effort. Well, we need to put effort into getting wisdom. And I tell you, it takes studying. And that's the reason I've been going verse by verse through the book of Proverbs. This has really been powerful. We're now in Proverbs chapter 28 and in verse 5. Boy, this is a great truth right here. It says, Evil men understand not judgment, but they that seek the Lord understand all things. Did you know on the surface, most people today would say this is not true, but this is the Word of God. This is absolutely true. And what this is saying is that when a person forsakes God and they embrace evil, it... it messes with your brain. It messes with the way that you think. You don't think straight. God created us in His image. He created us to be dependent upon Him. And He created us with this intuitive knowledge of right and wrong, this conscience. And when a person violates that and they start changing marriage to where two men, two women can supposedly marry, to where you can go out and shack up with the person and you don't have to marry at all, where you can go out and do dope and drugs and all of this kind of stuff, where you can do all of these things. When you start violating this conscience, it just makes you spiritually dull. You don't think straight. That's what this is saying. Evil men understand not judgment, but they that seek the Lord understand all things. When you seek the Lord, when you go to study in the Word of God, It'll give you wisdom. And that's it. this has been said a hundred times in the book of Proverbs, that studying the Word of God will make you wise. It will give understanding unto the simple. It will give discretion. It will teach these things. And therefore, the people who neglect the Word of God, evil people who don't study the Word and aren't seeking God, they just don't understand judgment. They, they don't think straight. You know, over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it talks about that in the end times, men are going to depart from the Lord, giving, you know, rejecting Him and His values, which we see happening in mass today. And it says that God will send them a strong delusion that they might believe a lie because they receive not a love of the truth. Boy, that is huge. That is a major thing that's being said right there. When you don't love the truth, you become susceptible to this delusion so that you could believe a lie so that they all might be damned who receive not the love of the truth. There is a demonic deception in this world and the thing that keeps us from coming under that and being deceived is a love of the truth, seeking God, loving God. People who don't love God and don't seek the Word of God they're spiritually retarded. I don't mean that in a bad way. I've had people criticize me. I'm not trying to slander anybody. I'm just saying your brain doesn't work right. Your elevator doesn't go to the top floor. Because some of the most basic ways of thinking is there is this 
intuitive knowledge of right and wrong. People know it's wrong to do things. It says in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 20, that God has revealed Himself from heaven against all unrighteousness and all ungodliness of men. And they have this intuitive knowledge on the inside of them, verse 20, so that even their uh, the eternal purpose in Godhead is known. People know better. But when you deny that knowledge and you go out and live in sin, you put a layer of hardness in between you and God. And if you do this over and over and over, you just after a while become hard-hearted, which Mark chapter 8 says a hard-hearted person can't remember, can't understand, can't perceive. Having eyes, you can't see. Having ears, you can't hear. You become spiritually retarded after you reject God over and over and over. Boy, this is powerful. This is something that ought to be a main uh, principle in our lives. We need to recognize that, man, if you aren't seeking God, you are just decreasing your own ability to think. You aren't going to function well. And again, I know that this secular world says, oh, no, that's not true. You're saying that these people that don't spend time studying the Word aren't smart and aren't intellectual. Well, they may be smart according to the world standards. You could have, you know, 32 degrees and still be frozen. That doesn't mean that you have enough practical wisdom. We got examples out the wazoo about people who've graduated from college and have all of these degrees and they're so ignorant that they can't function in this world. They're educated idiots. I'm not against anybody. I'm just saying that seeking God is a smart thing to do and it will make you smarter. Just like this said, evil men understand not judgment but they that seek the Lord understand all things. This answers so many questions about how can people in this nation see the exact same things and come to totally different conclusions about what is wrong and what the fix for it is. And it's because people who are evil have a paradigm, a way of looking at things that people who are godly see it just the opposite. Boy, those are major statements right there. In verse 6, Better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness than he that is perverse in his ways, though he be rich. In other words, this is just talking about that integrity, godliness, is much more beneficial than wealth. And some people say, well, I don't agree with that. I'd rather have money. I don't care. You know, that we look at these people who are living like animals. They have no integrity. These uh, many movie stars, sports figures, all of these people, they can't hold a marriage together. They're just constantly having scandals and stuff, but they've got money. They've got the house. They've got the acclaim. They're on the magazine covers, and there's a lot of people who envy them, which the Scripture has said a dozen times in the book of Proverbs not to do that. But there's people who look at that and think that they're just awesome. But the Bible says that a poor man who has uprightness is much better than the rich, even though they may have these things temporarily. And you know what? God's opinion is the only opinion that counts. That may not be what the people at your work think. That may not be what they're talking about at the water cooler. But there's coming a day when we're all going to stand before God. And I guarantee you, those attitudes right there are going to be the ones that count. And we're going to rue the day that we ever exalted and envied people who were immoral. It's just not the right thing to do. In verse 7, Whoso keepeth the law is a wise son, but he that is a companion of riotous men shameth his father. You know, this has already been dealt with probably, I don't know, half a dozen times in the book of Proverbs about how that we need to honor our parents, how that when we do something that's wrong, we shame them, we bring them to tears. Here it is being said again. And this time it says that if you are a companion of riotous men, you shame your father. In other words, you don't have to actually be the one who's doing it, but the people that you run with is a reflection on you and on your family. And there's many scriptures that talk about, uh, you know, a companion of fools is a fool, that you have to be a companion of wise men. The English word riotous here was translated from a Hebrew word that means to shake in the wind. That is to quake, figurative, to be loose, morally, worthless, or prodigal. Man, that's, that's amazing right there. And I guarantee you there are people who run with those who are loose, morally, worthless, or prodigal. 
and yet you don't want to go that way, but you're going to run with these people? It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. If you think that you can run with people who don't have your values and uh, it's not going to affect you, you're deceived. In verse 8 it says, He that by usury and unjust gain increaseth his substance, he shall gather it for him that will pity the poor. You know, the word usury here is talking about interest. And so it says that if you use interest and unjust gain to increase your substance, that God is against that and God will take it from you and give it to the poor. Now, I'm a little bit conflicted on this because if you just take this in its strictest sense, this is talking about interest, any interest. This would mean that loaning money as a bank or as a car dealership or, you know, you're getting furniture and you buy it on credit, that any interest would be wrong. And that would be the strictest interpretation of this. But in the New Testament, Jesus actually gave Proverbs and he, he gave five talents to one person, two talents to another, and one, uh, one talent to another person. And when he came back, the one who had five talents had used it and increased to 10. The one who had two had increased to four. But the one who had one just buried it. He was afraid that he wouldn't uh, use it properly. And so he just buried it. And when the master came back, he ba gave back his talent. And Jesus said, why didn't you put it out to the lenders so that I, when I came back, I could have received my own with usury? So in that instance, the Lord used entrance or usury as a positive thing and said we should put our money to work and make some money off of it. So I honestly uh, am a little bit conflicted on this. The way that I look at this right now is just to say this must be talking about an unjust interest rate. And we see people that do that. You know, right now at the time I'm making this program, I think that long-term home loans are down into the twos or certainly into the 3%. That's what the market is bearing. And yet you will find some people that are what we call loan sharks. And a person whose credit is bad and can't get a loan under normal circumstances, they'll loan money, but they may be charging 20% when the rest of the people are charging 3%. I think that this is what it's talking about is, is unfair interest, something that is just way, you're taking advantage of a person. And the Lord says, he's gonna deal with that. In verse nine, it says, he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law even his prayer shall be an abomination. Now this needs a little interpretation because in the New Testament, we aren't under the law. Man, I could give you dozens of scriptures on this out of the book of Romans, Hebrews, Galatians, and other places. We aren't under the law. The law was like a schoolmaster that brought us to Christ, but now that we're under Christ, we aren't under that schoolmaster anymore. So in one sense, we aren't under the law, but does this mean that we should just totally ignore the law, that we ought to ignore all of the standards, all of the instructions that God gave in the Old Testament? And the answer to that is no. There is still benefit. We aren't going to be punished now if we break the law because our punishment was placed upon Jesus. We can't base our relationship with God on our adherence to the law because it's not by that. It's by grace through faith and we put faith in what Jesus did. But the law still has a purpose, even for a born-again Christian. We don't live by it. We don't come under the curse and the punishment of it. But it does reveal to us what God's proper standard is. And when we turn away from it, and I've got people that have done this, that have heard about the grace of God, and now they are so free that they just ignore all of the instructions of God's Word because God loves them and they are free and they're going out here, I guarantee you that's a recipe for disaster. You just can't do that. We need instruction from the Word of God and the law, even though it has been fulfilled in Christ and we no longer are under its punishment and we no longer have to adhere to its laws in order to have a relationship with God, it still provides guidance. Now, we have to use some wisdom in that because there's certain things like the Sabbath. There was great penalties against people breaking the Sabbath. The Sabbath is now fulfilled in the New Testament in Jesus. Hebrews chapter 4 talks about that. The uh, laws about 
dietary laws, certain foods that you eat and foods that you don't eat and sacrifices that you offered on the new moon and the Sabbath day and all this, those things have been fulfilled. So we have to interpret this and recognize that now we don't offer blood sacrifices. We don't have to live by the dietary laws. We don't have to keep the Sabbath day because there is a New Testament fulfillment in it. But there still is benefit to looking back at the Old Testament and seeing the standards and it reveals the heart of God and what, his, what pleases Him. And if you are truly born again and love God, you want to please God. You aren't using grace as an excuse to go live in sin. So that's what this is talking about. If you turn away your ear from hearing the law, your prayer is an abomination. Now the Lord has said that when we pray, if you're born again and if you pray in the name of Jesus, He'll never uh, deny you because you have access to Him even in the time of need, even if you haven't lived totally and if you haven't done everything right. So the New Testament believer, there's a difference here, but still it's not pleasing to God. And if you truly are born again, you want to please God. You want to live for Him. There is still benefit to knowing what the law had to say. In verse 10 it says, Whoso causeth the righteous to go astray in an evil way, he shall fall himself into his own pit, but the upright shall have good things in possession. And this is just saying that there are people out there who are constantly trying to seduce the righteous. Earlier in the book of Proverbs, it talked about the strange woman, an adulterous woman who hunted for the precious life. In other words, it's not just a, a flesh flash where they did something on the spur of the moment. No, there are people that literally go out and try and ensnare the precious life, the righteous people. And when they do that, they are going to reap what they sow. They are going to be punished with the very thing that they sought to punish other people with. It's just a law of God. Whatever you sow, that shall you reap. Galatians 6, 7. In verse 11, it says, The rich man is wise in his own conceit, but the poor that hath understanding searcheth him out. This word conceit right here was translated I 495 times and sight 216 times in the Old Testament. So this is just saying that a rich man is, he, he plays these mind games and justifies all of his actions and in his own eye or in his own sight he's justified in the things that he's doing. But a wise man will search this out. A wise man will see through all of his excuses and things like this. In verse uh, 12, it says, When righteous men do rejoice, there is great glory. But when the wicked rise, a man is hidden. The Amplified Bible translates it this way. It says, When the uncompromisingly righteous triumph, there is great glory and celebration. But when the wicked rise to power, men hide themselves. And I think that that's getting across what this is talking about. In other words, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Man, when we elect people, when we put people in leadership, we need to choose righteous, godly people instead of wicked people. And you know what? You may not like either candidate that's running, but you have to pick the lesser of two evils. Which one is the closest to espousing godly values? In verse 13, it says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Did you know that this is, a, this is a tremendous proverb and truth right here that works with God and man. There are many scriptures that talks about that all sin can be forgiven through Jesus if we will just humble ourselves and confess and repent and receive our salvation. But it also works with men. Did you know that if you will humble yourself the vast majority of the times, it will totally diffuse a bad relationship and problems that you're having. I've got a, uh, a teaching that I teach in our Bible school to our second year students and it's how to get along with people. A lot of it is based on Matthew chapter 18 where Jesus said that if somebody's offended, you go to them first just between you and them. If they don't listen to that, bring one or two more with you. If they don't listen to that, bring it before the church. And if they won't listen to the church, then you have to treat them as a heathen and a publican. And I teach on this that there are things that we can do to get along with people. And the very first thing is that if you know that a person has offended you, the scripture says, if they have ought against you, you don't even have to have ought against them. 
Jesus said, if your brother has ought against you and you come to the altar and remember that this man has ought against you, leave your gift there and first go be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. And so I'm saying all that to say that if we would, if we would humble ourselves and when we do something wrong, just say, look, you know, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. The vast majority of the times that will totally diffuse the situation. And the other person, it's not our human nature to humble ourselves and to confess that we're wrong. And when you do that, the other person knows how hard this is for you. And in the majority of cases, if you will do that, they will humble themselves. But as I heard Keith Moore say, don't ever, ever ruin a good apology with an excuse. What I mean by that is that if you've done something wrong, don't go and say, well, I was wrong, but you were wrong too. You started this whole thing. The moment you've done that, you've just ruined your apology. You know what? If the other person has done something wrong, if they were 90% of the problem and you were 10%, doesn't matter. Don't confess they're 90%. That's not your business. You go and humble yourself. I'm sorry. And when you say things like this, the average person will say, well, that'll make me vulnerable. They'll use my confession and my admission of guilt as an opportunity against me. And if all you were doing was just dealing with things on a human scale, well, that might not be wisdom to do. You're giving them ammunition. But because there is a God who said that He would exalt us when we humble ourselves, He would give grace to us. When you humble yourself and when you take the high road by debasing yourself and humbling yourself, God will intervene. God will promote you. And whether that other person ever responds properly or not, God will. Man, I'd rather have God blessing me than to have any person in my corner. In verse 14, it says, Happy is the man that feareth all way, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. When we uh, fear the Lord, and I think it's Proverbs 8, 13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance, and every evil way do I hate. When you fear the Lord like that and humble yourself and put God first, God is going to promote you. But when you harden your heart, man, you are going to fall into mischief. In verse 15, it says, As a roaring lion and a raging bear, so is a wicked ruler over the poor people. You know, nobody wants to be around a roaring lion or a raging bear. Man, it's dangerous. We'd run from a situation like that. You ought to run from a wicked ruler. And yet I see people in these election cycles that will, will vote for a person who promises them some money even though you know they're wicked, even though that you know they've done things wrong and you'll just vote for them. The only way I would do that is if it was the lesser of two evils which sometimes that's what we've got to do. In verse 16, the prince that wanteth understanding is also a great oppressor, but he that hateth covetousness shall prolong his days. This is talking about it doesn't matter what position of authority you have. If you are lack understanding, you are going to oppress people. You need the wisdom of God to rule. And when you hate covetousness, you prolong your days. I've made this point many times through the book of Proverbs, but there are people that will put so much emphasis on what you eat and on exercise, and yet they are covetous. They are evil. They're immoral. They don't even take those things into account. They don't honor their father and mother. And I'm telling you, I believe that these spiritual things are much more important than just physical things, and that's what this is talking about. If you hate covetousness, you'll prolong your days. We trust you're growing in wisdom as you study along with Andrew through the book of Proverbs. You can get the entire series that covers all 31 chapters of Proverbs in a CD or DVD album for a gift of any amount when you contact us. If you'd like to enhance your study, make sure to get a copy of Andrew's brand new hardcover book on Proverbs that includes all of his personal study notes and commentary on hundreds of verses. This book is available for a gift of any amount. If you'd like to receive all of Andrew's available resources on Proverbs, make sure to order the Proverbs package. This package includes the entire Proverbs teaching in both CD and DVD albums, the brand new hardcover book, and the Proverbs software on a USB drive for your Windows computer. This special USB drive contains the Proverbs portion from the Living Commentary 
with all of Andrew's personal study notes on the entire book of Proverbs in digital form. You can get this valuable package for just $199. Contact us to order the Proverbs package today. The 15th audio teaching in today's series is available for a gift of any amount when you write or call. We encourage everyone to give, but if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this 15th CD free of charge. We want to say a special thank you to the Grace Partners of Andrew Womack Ministries. Your gifts make it possible to put free ministry materials into the hands of many people in need. If you're not already a Grace Partner, we ask you to pray about becoming one today. You can become a Grace Partner or order resources through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download many free resources. Or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Our helpline number is 719-635-1111. If the lines are busy, remember, you can order ministry materials or become a Grace Partner 24 hours a day, 7 days a week at awmi.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. In the month of October, he'll be at the Sanctuary in Woodland Park, Colorado for the annual Andrew Womack Ministers Conference in West Bromwich and Walsall, England, in Kampala, Uganda, and in Nairobi, Kenya. In November, Andrew will be back in Woodland Park to host the brand new musical titled David, and also for the dedication of the new Andrew Womack Ministries Auditorium with special guests Jesse Duplantis and Kenneth Copeland. Also in November, Andrew will be in Toronto, Canada and Granville, Michigan. And in December, Andrew will be hosting a special holiday production titled The Heart of Christmas at the Sanctuary in Woodland Park. The Heart of Christmas is an unforgettable mix of modern day and biblical stories with heartwarming, familiar seasonal songs and American traditions that represent the true meaning of the season. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, visit our website at awmi.net. Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and I'd like to encourage you to check out our Gospel Truth TV. You've got well-known people on there like Kenneth Copeland, Creflo Dollar, Jesse Duplantis, Keith Moore, and it's a safe place to be. You are going to be blessed. So check it out. It's 24-7, gospeltruth.tv. Thanks to the support of our friends and partners, Karis Bible College is able to reach more people with the Gospel than ever before through the continued expansion of our Phase Two building project. For the latest information on the Phase Two construction update, go to awmi.net.